tomorrow in Zoom. And what I thought I'd do is give an introduction to the Hebrew Bible. The first thing to note is what I'm calling it there is the Hebrew Bible. Um, I use that term, uh, and that's what we'll commonly use in our class, because it was, first of all, written in Hebrew, right? That's the, the Semitic language in which the um, uh, these books are written, including Genesis, which we're reading. Um, now, uh, the other reason is because there's, um, uh, you may know this material under different names. So within a Christian context, uh, you would speak of the Hebrew Bible often as the Old Testament. And that is supplemented, of course, by the New Testament, which is the story of the life of Jesus and reflections on that in the early Christian community. So for Christians, there's the New Testament, and that is built upon the Old Testament. Um, if you are uh, reading it from a Jewish perspective, then, of course, there's nothing old about it, except, of course, it's old in age. Um, but it's not updated by um, by anything further, right? So um, uh, for uh, our kind of common reference as a class, we will just talk about the Hebrew Bible. Um, the first book of the Hebrew Bible, though not the first written, but the first book uh, as we have it is the book of Genesis. And we are going to be looking at Genesis 1 through 10. And this is the portion of Genesis that gives this kind of universal history about human beings, the creation of the world, a whole bunch of firsts, the first murder, the flood, the universal flood, um, the Tower of Babel. These are all these kinds of big, well-known stories that occur here in the first 10 chapters uh, of the book of Genesis. Um, it, after chapter 10, chapters 11 and following, um, it, things narrow down quite a bit, and we'll continue with that on Friday. But we get the story of Abraham, and Abraham is the father of the nation of Israel. So the ancient Israelite nation uh, comes from Abraham, and the, the remainder, which is really the, the bulk, the vast majority of the Hebrew Bible, really takes up the story of God's interaction with this specific people, Abraham and his descendants who grow into a nation. Um, and there's a special relationship between God and his people. But in these first 10 chapters of Genesis, we get something a little bit larger. We get a concept of God um, kind of uh, setting the stage of human history in general through creation and these early stories of um, humanity. Um, now, we the Bible, right? The Bible for Christians consists of the Old and the New Testament. Um, uh, within a Jewish context, we it's called the Tanakh, which includes the Torah, these first five books of the Bible, including Genesis, the prophets, uh, and the writings. Um, uh, but that is uh, what many of you may know as the Old Testament. Um, this is a scripture. Uh, this won't be the only scripture we run into in this class, but it's kind of a scripture that many of you will have some uh, experience with. And I want to just think for a moment about why do communities have scriptures? What's valuable about a scripture? And the first thing I would say is if you go back to our definition of religion, um, formulating conceptions of a general order of existence. Well, this material that we're reading obviously does that, right? It's it's big picture where do human beings fit in? Who is God? Um, what's the connection or the problem between human beings and the world and and God? You know, it's, it's asking these very large questions. And in some ways, you can see this as allowing people to kind of fit themselves into the world and understand where they fit in. So a general order of existence. I think if you read um, Genesis 1 through 10, that's basically the definition of a general order of existence, right? Um, also, uh, uh, you can also think of um, uh, scriptures as asking questions, right? So sometimes people think of scriptures as being the answer place, and you'll see, you'll hear sermons, uh, maybe even we'll run into some as we go through this class, but um, hear sermons online which talk about the Bible as kind of an answer book. And I think what we'll be struck with as we read Genesis is the extent to which there are questions that are being asked. 
and stories being told and stories that are kind of that it's unclear exactly what we're supposed to be doing with them and how we're supposed to think about them. So I would ask you to kind of open up your mind about what a scripture is and how to understand it. It's not the thing, the place you go that has all the answers. It's more an agreed upon set of, of um, questions and stories. And generation after generation goes back to these stories and talks about them and tries to make sense of what they might mean in the new context. Um, and that's a kind of dialogue and discussion that scriptures engage with. Um, and groups, you know, groups we saw with the mounds, the way there was a continuity over generations that the mounds allowed. And scriptures are something that, that meet some of the same, um, uh, uh, that, that accomplish something similar, right? Over generations, people are reading the same words, talking about the same stories, and that is a way to build continuity um, and a common vocabulary uh, for understanding the world and how human beings should respond in the world, all right? Um, so let me make a few points about uh, Genesis 1 through 10 that might escape you. So maybe you've read these in a Sunday school or just pick things, you know, the story of Noah and the flood is just kind of floating out there. You might've even seen it on, you know, children's cartoons or something like that. Um, but give this a good serious read, Genesis 1 through 10. Um, a couple points that I wanna make. Um, the first is you have Genesis 1, which is the seven day creation story. We'll spend a lot of time in class talking about that. But then as you move into Genesis 2 and 3, you get another set of famous stories, which is about Adam and Eve and the serpent and the first sin. Now, one thing that often escapes people is that you have pretty obviously two very different stories of creation going on. So you have these seven day creation uh, where human beings are created on the last day and then God rests. But then um, uh, in chapter two, you get the story of Adam and Eve. And it says, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, uh, and then we get this alternative creation account. Um, and so what I would say that we're invited to do is think of these as kind of juxtaposing creation views, probably from very different time periods and with very different concerns. The one more concerned about this kind of universal system of the world uh, and the other more concerned about human beings and their moral relationship to God. Uh, but you really can't you know, if you look at the beginning of that second one, this is chapter two, verse four, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Well, how does that match up with chapter one that we've just read about these seven days? It doesn't. When no plant of the field was yet in the earth. Well, wait a second. Plants were created well before human beings. So what does that mean? No plant of the field was yet in the earth. These are different creation accounts. And so one way to uh, something to be alert for as you're reading Genesis is that you have kind of juxtapositions of material that are being stitched and edited together. Scholars in the 19th century came around and divided uh, some of these sections up into J, E, D, P. There was the Yahweh, the J section, the Elohistic uh, sections, the E section, Deuteronomic, much of the book of Deuteronomy, the D, and then the P is the priestly. And so you, it seems pretty clear that you had a lot of kind of disparate material floating around. Uh, and then at some point, these were brought together and edited together. And at times the seams where things were stitched together show through pretty clearly. And this, this um, conjunction of chapter one and then chapters two and three is one place where you see those seams pretty clearly. You know, if you're looking very carefully, you can see other seams as well. So for example, in chapter one, it's always God, 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 Elohim. And then if you move into chapter two, you get this word, Lord God, Lord God. And you'll notice that it's Lord with capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And what that signifies is that because Jews wouldn't say the name of God, Yahweh, there would be a kind of, you'd hide that behind a euphemism. You just say Lord. Um, uh, and when you see that ca all the caps Lord, that means that the word for God, Yahweh, is behind it. So you get this kind of Yahweh uh, section 
in you know you often hear that as jehovah for that's the kind of germanic version of yahweh um uh here in chapters two and three and it's a god who's very physical and who's walking around and talking to adam and eve in chapter one it's a god who's creating with his voice and seems very distant and kind of discombobulated so the, here you see an example of these two sections each harboring a different creation story, each presenting a fairly, a very different vision of who God is and what uh, God's relationship to his creation uh, might be. All right. Um, uh, you know, the other stories that you're going to get include the killing of Cain and Abel, uh, the flood, the flood of Noah. Um, and some, you also see a lot of kind of, um, uh, uh, material of generation, so and so begat so and so. And it's easy to skip over that material, but chapter 10 is a bunch of names, and students very rarely read chapter 10 with any care. But let me just kind of look at it really quickly. You have three of Noah's descendants Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The descendants of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madvi, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. And then it goes through various people, descendants of Ham. Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Uh, Canaan became the father, father of Sidon. He goes through all these different names. Now, so part of you might think, well, that's just kind of meaningless to me. But what I kind of want to point out here is that a lot of those names line up with ancient people groups. So Akkad, A-C-C-A-D is in here. Well, there's the Akkadians. Um, Descendants of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Cain. Those are all geographic names, right? Um, so basically what's happening is that the is that you're sitting here in a fairly narrow piece of land, right? The ancient king state of Israel. Um, and then looking around from Israel, you there was some, some patterns that were being picked up. Japheth, there were Indo-European-based groups. Um, Ham, there were um, groups of Hamitic languages most notably Egypt, um, but there were other peoples in Africa as well that spoke Hamitic languages. That was kind of a, a language grouping. Um, and then Canaan, um, uh, Shem, the Semitic language groups, right? So for us, this is very dated because we know there are a lot of groups and peoples that aren't included in this at all. But if you can imagine yourself back into this narrow piece of land on the Eastern Mediterranean, the ancient state of Israel, this was very explanatory. Ge about ge geography, that this is why there are these peoples, these groups of peoples in different nations, but whose languages can be kind of grouped together in, in certain ways. They come from a certain family of languages. And that was explained by these rules of descendants, right? That, that oh, so this family comes from this person, this from another, this from another. And yes, there are multiple states, but those are the sons of this one person. So this is um, a way to kind of give order to the people groups that had surrounded um, uh, the ancient state of Israel. Not interesting if we take it as being literal truth, then it becomes just baffling. But if we try to imagine ourselves back into the minds of an ancient people trying to make sense of lineage and people groups, it makes a lot of sense. And that's what I'd invite you to do as we're reading this. Do your best to kind of imagine what people are seeing in this um, in a historical sort of fashion. And that's what, when we'll talk about doing that uh, on Wednesday. The question for you in your response is, find something in here that rep represents the general order of existence. Not in chapter one, because that's easy. It's just the cre where creation and animals and trees and the sun comes from. But in the other chapters, give me an example um, of something that might even be surprising, but that represents the general order of existence. What are we learning about the general order of existence? That could have to do with, with gender, with work, with life, with um, uh, crime, with something about human beings. What is it? Give me something that's explained by these first 10 chapters uh, of the book of Genesis. And that'll be your response for tomorrow. All right, I'll see you all tomorrow on Zoom.